Hello and welcome. Ah, uh, good. It's going to stay. Ha <laughs> ha. Welcome to Mrs. Pam Reads. This is my back porch, and remember, I'm here by myself, so I have to come around from the camera. Whoop! Let me do my hair. I got some funny stuff happening up there with my hair. Anyway, we are reading a man called Ove. My cat's visiting. Oh. By Frederick Backman. And ah. I'm going to try my reading glasses today. It has um, been a little interesting. Woo. <laughs> it's been a little interesting with my bifocals because sometimes it gets a little blurry. So today we're going to try it with the reading glasses. Now we are on chapter five today, and I forgot to look and see how many, oh, I think we'll have to divide chapter five up. Um, in chapter three, if you've been following all along, you may have gotten a little inkling that something was amiss with Obey's wife. And in chapter four, Four, at the very end, we did learn that his wife has died about six months before this story starts. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So we're chapter five, and it's actually entitled A Man Called Ove, just like the book. Ove knew very well that her friends couldn't understand why she married him. He couldn't really blame them. People said he was bitter. Maybe they were right. He'd never reflected much on it. People also called him antisocial. Ove assumed this meant he wasn't overly keen on people. And in this instance, he could totally agree with them. More often than not, people, people were out of their minds. Ove wasn't one to engage in small talk. He had come to realize that, these days at least, this was a serious character flaw. Now, one had to be able to blabber on about anything with any old sod who happened to stray within an arm's length of you, purely because it was nice. Ove didn't know how to do it. Perhaps it was the way he'd been raised. Maybe men of his generation had never been sufficiently prepared for a world where everyone spoke about doing things even though it no longer seemed worth doing them. Nowadays, people stood outside in their newly refurbished houses and boasted as if they'd built them with their own bare hands, even though they hadn't so much as lifted a screwdriver and they weren't even trying to pretend that it was any other way. They boasted about it. Apparently, there was no longer any value in being able to lay your own floorboards or refurbish a room with rising damp or changing winter tires. Interesting. And if you could just go and buy everything what was the value of it? What was the value of a man? Her friends couldn't see why she woke up every morning and voluntarily decided to share the whole day with him. He couldn't either. He built her a bookshelf and she filled it with books by people who wrote page after page about their feelings. Ove understood things he could see and touch, wood and concrete, glass and steel, tools, things one could figure out. He understood right angles and clear instruction manuals. 
assembly models, and drawings. Things one could draw on paper. He was a man of black and white. And she was color. All the color he had. The only thing he had ever loved until he saw her was numbers. He had no other particular memory of his youth. He was not bullied, and he wasn't a bully, not good at sports, and not bad either. He was never at the heart of things, and never outside. He was the sort of person who was just there. Nor did he remember so very much about his growing up. He had never been the sort of man who went around remembering things unless there was a need for it. He remembered that he was quite happy and that for a few years afterwards, he wasn't. That was about it. And he remembered songs. The numbers filled his head. Remembered how he longed for their mathematics lessons at school Maybe for the others, they were a sufferance, but not for him. He didn't know why and didn't speculate about it either. He'd never understood the need to go around stewing on things that didn't turn out the way you wanted them to. You are what you are and you do what you do. And that was good enough for Ove. He was seven years old when his mum called it a day one early August morning. She worked at the chemicals plant. In those days, people didn't know much about air safety, Ove realized later. She smoked as well, all the time. That's Ove's clearest memory of her how she sat in the kitchen window of the little house where they lived outside town with that billowing cloud around her, watching the sky every Saturday morning. And how sometimes she sang in her hoarse voice and Obe used to sit under the window with his mathematics book in his lap. And he remembered that he liked listening to her. He remembers that. Of course, her voice was hoarse and the odd note was more, more discordant than one would have liked, but he remembers that he liked it anyway. Obey's father worked for the railways. The palms of his hands looked like someone had carved into leather with knives. Ooh and the wrinkles in his face were so deep that when he exerted himself, the sweat was channeled through them down to his chest. His hair was thin and his body slender, but the muscles on his arms were so sharp that they seemed cut out of rock. Once when Ove was very young, he was allowed to go with his parents to a big party with his dad's friends from the rail company. After his father had put away a couple of bottles of Pilsner, some of the other guests challenged him to an arm wrestling competition. Ove had never seen the like of these giants straddling the bench opposite him. Some of them looked like they weighed about 400 pounds. His father wore down every one of them. When they went home that night, he put his arm around Obey's shoulders and said, Obey, only a swine thinks size and strength are the same thing. Remember that. And Obey never forgot. His father never raised his fists, not to Obey or anyone else. Ove had classmates who came to school with black eyes or bruises from a belt buckle after a thrashing, but never Ove. We don't fight in this family, his father used to state, 
not with each other or anyone else. He was well liked down at the railway, quiet but kind. There were some who said he was too kind. Ove remembers how as a child he could never understand how this could be something bad. Then mom died and dad grew even quieter as if she took away with her the few words he'd possessed. So Ove and his father never talked excessively, but they liked each other's company. They sat in silence on either side of the kitchen table and had ways of keeping busy. Every other day, they put out food for a family of birds living in a rotting tree at the back of the house. It was important, Ove understood, that it had to be every other day. He didn't know why, but that didn't matter. In the evenings, they had sausages and potatoes. Then they played cards. They never had much, but they always had enough. His father's only remaining words were about engines. Apparently, his mother was content to leave these behind. He could spend any amount of time talking about them. Engines give you what you deserve, he used to explain. If you treat them with respect, they'll give you freedom. If you behave like an ass, they'll take it from you. For a long time, he did not own a car of his own. But in the 1940s and 50s, when the bosses and directors at the railway started buying their own vehicles, a rumor soon spread in the office that the quiet man working on the track was a person well worth knowing. Ove's father had never finished school and didn't understand much about the sums in Ove's school books, but he understood engines. When the daughter of the director was getting married and the wedding car broke down, rather ceremoniously transporting the bride to church, Ove's father was sent for. He came cycling with a tool, tool box on his shoulder, so heavy that it took two men to lift it when he got off the bicycle. Whatever the problem was when he arrived, it was no longer a problem when he cycled back. The director's wife invited him to the wedding reception, but he told her that it was probably not the done thing to sit with elegant people when one was the sort of man whose forearms were so stained with oil that it seemed a natural part of his pigment. But he'd gladly accept a bag of bread and meat for the lad at home, he said. Ove had just turned eight. When his father laid out the supper that evening, Ove felt like he was at a royal banquet. A few months later, the director sent for Ove's father again. In the parking area outside the office stood an extremely old and worse for wear Saab 92. It was the first motor car Saab had ever manufactured, although it had not been in production since the significantly upgraded Saab 93 had come onto the market. Ove's dad recognized it very well. Front wheel driven and a side mounted engine that sounded like a curf coffee percolator. It had been in an accident, the director explained, sticking his thumbs into his suspenders under his jacket. The bottle green body was badly dented and the condition of what lay under the hood was certainly not pretty. But Ove's father produced a little screwdriver from the pocket of his dirty overalls. And after lengthily inspecting the car, 
he gave the verdict that with a bit of time and care and the proper tools, he'd be able to put it back into working order. Whose is it? He wondered aloud as he straightened up and wiped the oil from his fingers with a rag. It belonged to a relative of mine, said the director, digging out a key from his suit trousers and pressing it into his palm. And now it's yours. With a pat on his shoulder, the director returned to the office. Ove's father stayed where he was in the courtyard, trying to catch his breath. That evening, he had to explain everything over and over again to his googly-eyed son and show all there was to know about this magical monster now parked in their garden. He sat in the driver's seat half the night <laughs> with the boy on his lap, explaining how all the mechanical parts were connected. He could account for every screw, every little tube. Obe had never seen a man as proud as his father was that night. He was eight years old and decided that night he would never drive any car but a sob. Whenever he had a Saturday off, Obe's father brought him out into the yard, opened the hood, and taught him all the names of the various parts and what they did. On Sundays, they went to church, not because either of them had any excessive zeal for God, but because Obe's mum had always been insistent about it. They sat at the back each of them staring at a patch on the floor until it was over. And, in all honesty, they spent more time missing Ove's mum than thinking about God. It was her time, so to speak, even though she was no longer there. Afterwards, they take a long drive in the countryside with the sob. It was Ove's favorite part of the week. And I think we're going to stop right there before my battery runs out. So that's the first half of chapter five. We'll pick up the second half of chapter five in the next video. Thank you for joining me for Mrs. PM Reads. I know I gotta get my little sign here for you. All right. Please remember to click the subscribe button, and when you do, you'll find a little bell. Click on the bell, and you will get an update when a new video posts. All right, you guys, thanks for joining me. Have a great day, and I will see you next time.